welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host. Our guest author is Bishop Jan Leeson from the Diocese of Den Bosch in the Netherlands. And we're talking to him about the Come and See Catholic Bible Study Series and the particular one that he wrote on the wisdom literature. And it's published by Emmaus Road. Thank you so much, Bishop, for having you here. Thank you. Uh, some of our audience would have seen you a few months back. Uh, you actually uh, did uh, Mass for us one day, right, right. etc., and preached. So let me ask you, you know, uh, the Come and See Catholic Bible Study seems to have its roots, from what I can tell, in like Florida. Uh, but you're not from Florida, or that's the connection that I see. You're from the Netherlands. Let's talk about the bridge that connected Florida and the Netherlands. Very well. Um, well, I am a bishop now, in, an auxiliary bishop in the Diocese of Sertogenbos. For 27 years, I was a priest of the Diocese of Roermond. And for about 20 years, I was teaching scripture in the seminary there. Mm -hmm. And um, back in 1995, um, the spiritual director of the seminary died. Somebody else took his place, but he couldn't take all, all his responsibilities. So the question came to me whether I would want to give a retreat. Mm -hmm. There were many retreats to be given. And since I was dealing with scripture and it was scripture based, I should do it. I was a little bit hesitant to do it because I had never done it. Mm -hmm. um, but they pressed and I did it finally. And there I, I really uh, had a wonderful experience that all that I had learned in order to teach scripture to seminarians, that it could become fruitful in a whole other way, namely in bringing people closer to God through the Word of God. Mm -hmm. And I have been doing that for years, uh, ever since, giving retreats. And so it, I went abroad in Germany, which is very mm -hmm. close to where I was, and I gave retreats to German sisters who have an American province. Oh, okay. So I got okay. invited to the United States, okay. that's 2005. Okay. And more and more got added to that. And then I got in touch with an old friend of mine, Father Joseph Panessa, mm -hmm. who's a priest of the Diocese of Great Falls in Montana. Now he's involved with some of the other yes, versions. Yes, he is of very the, much involved. The one on uh, Acts and Letters and Genesis. Yes, right. he wrote several volumes in this series. Okay. So we were actually students together in Rome in the Biblical Institute. That's, so that was your connection? That was our connection. Okay. He was in Europe in 2004, I guess it was, and heard that I was coming to the States in 2005. And with him was uh, Mrs. Laurie Manhart, who is also uh, okay. behind these series. Right, okay. And, um, well, they invited me to be part of a summer Bible school, okay. which, they, which is also part of this uh, series. Um, and I had the opportunity, and the travel expense was being made anyway, so mm -hmm. I said, yes, I will do that. Right. So I joined with them and got to know what they were doing, and uh, I liked it very much. Mm -hmm. What I liked particularly was that this was a way in which people could grow closer to God. They could mm -hmm. study the Bible, but it was not just imparting knowledge, mm -hmm. facts, historical okay. facts and so on about the Bible. But um, you see, if you go through these, this method here in this book, um, you have to have not only the Bible, mm -hmm. but also the catechism. Right. Every uh, chapter, has a couple of pages of uh, information, right. but then there are questions to be answered. This is like a workbook. It's actually. like a workbook, really. Right, so right. you can do it alone or mm -hmm. with a group. But when you do that, you have to go through the catechism. Right. And uh, I don't know how about it is in the United States, but in our country, for most people, catechesis stopped right. after primary school. Right. There, there's not much knowledge about the faith. Well, about the only thing anybody heard about <coughs> in the States was something called the Dutch Catechism. I know about that. Which was somewhat <laughs> pro problematic, right? So More than problematic, yeah, right, right. in the 60s. But right. in the Netherlands, it also disappeared after mm. that. Did it? Okay. Oh, yeah, completely. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So let me ask you, I mean, when you, when, when you started getting to this kind of a Bible scripture study, and a lot of things we've, we've seen over the last few years has been, uh, you know, coming out of Vatican II, an emphasis on on Catholics making sure they understand scripture in the light of the teachings of the church as right. well, the traditions, and a lot of great Protestant uh, teachers like a Scott Hahn and, and Jeff Cavins and others have helped to bring over, I think, some of the teaching methodologies that the Protestants have been using for years, which I think are helpful as well. Um, 
Was it different for you, though? Because a lot of times we get the impression that for years, and especially sometimes in Europe, and this may be just a, an American-centric view, that it's kind of, you know, very heavy on the critical method and, you know, what, you know, the <clears throat> Jesus seminar kind of approach and that, you know, we're kind of parsing out what's real and not and the miracles kind of get taken away. Is it like that or is that, is that a misperception? So that's not this series. That's not this series. I know not that. Not at all. But is that the way it, it was when you went to seminary or growing no, up? No, not or? at all. When, I, okay. when I went to the seminary, well, I have to go a little bit back. Yeah. Because you know what happened in the Netherlands in the 60s, 67, 68, all seminaries were closed. Okay. All of them. Really? More okay. than 30. And five theological faculties were erected in universities. And the immediate result was that the number of ordinations dropped from like 120 per year to zero. Vocations dropped drastically, mm -hmm. practically zero. Pope Paul VI then in the early 70s appointed some new bishops. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was one bishop, the Bishop of Roermond, Monsieur Geisse, who had this idea to start a new seminary just to implement Second Vatican Council. Okay. Because the prevailing idea in the Netherlands was, we have seen this, we know this, we get over this and we start something new. So they were not interested mm -hmm. in implementing the Second Vatican Council. In a sense, they, did they see that as, in a sense, a license to kind of do what yeah, we think they we can want to do? You know, the phrase that was used time and again is, we work in the spirit of the Second Vatican Council. Right, right, you must right. have heard that here, oh, too. Oh, yes, yes. Or it's, now sometimes when that doesn't work, they'll say the spirit of, uh, you know, uh, the Pope who started, you know. The, okay, well, know. but that's the same thing, really. Yeah, you know, same kind of but thing. But this right. bishop in 72... Um, when the people of his town wanted to give him a gift for his ordination, he let out the word, I want a seminary. Mm -hmm. And then money came in from the whole country, really. Mm -hmm. And he started this new seminary. Um, and he called in professors from all over Europe because the mm -hmm. Dutch religious and other bishops were not so helpful mm -hmm. there. And we got very good professors. And um, that was a very good right. period, that, right. that seminary. I was trained there. Right. I ended in 78 uh, till 83. And the exegesis that we had, yes, to some extent, it was historical critical. Mm -hmm. It was. But there was always this nuance that but this was just one this aspect. This balance, balance It's not just exactly. this is the only way to look at things. Exactly. And what really balanced it is we had spiritual formation. Mm -hmm. So we were praying with Scripture. Right. Right. And we were taught how to live with the Word of God. Right. And uh, that puts everything in another perspective. The Lexio Divina. You know, also, much, yeah, right? exactly. Okay. I went to uh, a parish mm -hmm. for about two years. I was very happy mm -hmm. there. Got a call from the bishop that I had to go to Rome. I didn't want to go, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, but he said, uh, now you have 5,000 parishioners and you're happy. That's good. Right. But if you come back from Rome, you will be teaching. And through your students, you may reach not 5,000, but 50 or 500,000 people. Mm -hmm. So you have to go. Right. So I went. So in, in, in putting this together based on how you started, you know, in your parish and doing these lectures, how representative are these particular books in this Bible study series, Come and See? Um, was it, or, since it sounded like it was sort of up and running when you became part of it, right? Right, it uh, was. So did you have to adapt <coughs> what you had done already to fit into their format, or how did that work? Not much, really, okay. because you see Father Panessa, for instance, um, and also the other priests who are involved, uh, right. Monsignor uh, Charles Kolsanki, uh, Monsignor Jan Meijernek, and uh, Father Andreas Huck. They, we all studied at the Biblicum. Okay. And now one of the mottos, I can say, of the Biblicum was this. And this puts the historical critical method in perspective. There was one professor who think I've, who put it in the best way. He said, if you do exegesis, you have to do a lot of hard work and you will sweat. Mm -hmm. But what you communicate to the people is not your sweat. Mm -hmm. You will communicate only the fruits of your right. work. So leave out all the details about how many times this word appears and mm -hmm. there and all the circumstantial evidence. Mm -hmm. That's not going to help anybody. Right. So give them the fruits of your work. Right. So when I came to this Bible studies, right. these series, uh, these priests were working in this method. 
and I know that method. Right. So uh, you know, it didn't take much adaptation to to adjust myself to this. Do you see that well. as one of the strengths, in a sense, of the church, in the sense that people from all over the world get to work and study together and build relationships? So there are these yes. universal connections. There are, there are, and this is one of the most beautiful things in my experience mm -hmm. of of our church. Right. Uh, when you come from the Netherlands, you come from a very small country, mm -hmm. and you come to Rome and you meet priests from all over the world. Right. Uh, that's a wonderful experience. Right. You realize and you're you not share alone, the faith. Right? Yeah, you, you share the faith. Right. To give you one right. example, I had never spoken English before I came to Rome. And Your the English students, is very good, obviously. Well, that's why I'm telling <laughs> you. <laughs> students were organized in language groups. Mm -hmm. So the best language for me would have been German, mm -hmm. but it was not there. So I joined the English language group. And what happened is that these priests and religious from the whole English-speaking world, they helped me. Right. They corrected me, and that is how I got to speak English. Right. And basically, we shared the faith, right. and we worked together. Right. And that's a wonderful experience. Right. Now, the, the particular one you wrote, you, you wrote on the, the wisdom literature, right? On the, the books yeah. and the... Now, let me ask you, now, this is in English, obviously. It is in English. Did you write it in English, or did I you... I did. Okay, so you yeah. wrote it originally in English. Yeah. Now, is there a version that's uh, in other languages, or is English the only version right now? English is the only version right now. Um, now that I'm no longer a professor in the seminary, mm -hmm. but an auxiliary bishop, I have plans in this new diocese where I am to continue with this series. So you will have the time to continue to do this? Uh, You're gonna have to be able to time to write another well, you know, one of the, the books? This or? is one of the things that happens when you become an auxiliary bishop. You can make time oh, okay, to do okay, it. Okay. So I will make time to do this. There will be an English uh, version of it, mm. but I hope there will also be a Dutch version of it. Would you just translate it, basically? Is that I will basically thinking? just translate Since it. Since you sounded like you did translations as a normal course of I have prior. done many translations, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now, one of the things that struck me, too, was interesting, and just in the sense <coughs> of the practical aspect of this particular series and book, it starts off with practical needs. Ask God for wisdom about whom to study with, where, and when to meet. Why, why is that important? Um, when you study and you do it on your own, you have only your own resources to fall back on. And if you come together with a group, and if you know uh, the people in this group, for instance, you could, it would be very good to invite your priest from your parish or a religious in, in the vicinity to mm -hmm. come there. You would have the security of mm -hmm. somebody who is well trained to be there with you, to help you. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the Bible is the Word of God, yes, but it comes in a human form. Mm -hmm. And there are all kinds of things that you're not familiar with. And if you're on your own, it's n not that uncommon that you make a wrong interpretation. Right, right. So it is very good to be helped by others. And that's why also being tied into the catechism is so important. Right? Exactly, right. exactly, yeah. Right. Exactly. The other thing that I thought was interesting, too, in, in that that struck me was uh, that uh, number three on this list, uh, it says, show this book to your pastor and ask for his approval and direction. Because you should not study the Bible, uh, how can I say that, start a separate mm -hmm. group in the parish that the priest would not know about. Mm -hmm. I have been in the parish long enough, although it was not long, but long enough to know how that works. Mm -hmm. um, you see, what happens in a parish often is that there's a good initiative mm -hmm. from somewhere, and the parishioners on whom you rely for the parish, mm -hmm. they are drawn to that, they're taken in by that, and off they go. Mm -hmm. That is what you do not want to happen okay. in a parish. You want those people there. So if you have this Bible study, do it locally, do it mm -hmm. there, and involve the priest. So it's, in a sense, part of the parish. Exactly, life, it should be a parish activity. Not a separate kind of thing. No, and the priest may be too busy. Okay, right. that's understandable, but at least go and ask him. And, you know, over time he may find more possibilities, right. so What, what if somebody touch? looks at this, I saw it online, and I've, I've read some of the come and see, and it looks like a wonderful Bible study, but my pastor looks and he says, well, this isn't my view of how scripture gets studied. What do you do? Um, you pray for him. Okay. <laughs> um, but you can still study it with a group. Um, <clears throat> I think that some of these groups that come together are just, 
sometimes from various parishes, mm -hmm. no? Right, okay. So it does not always depend on one right. priest, so. Right. Well, the other thing, again, just talking about this from a practical perspective, lo logistical considerations. Jesus chose a group of 12 apostles, so perhaps 12 or 13 people make the best small groups. When you get too many, you break into two groups. You know, that's also just a human factor. Right. If you are with 20 or more persons, what tends to happen is that some uh, never get to say anything. Right. Some people are more quiet by nature. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important that everyone um, is on equal terms there. Right. So if the group is too large, mm -hmm. uh, there's not enough or not the right kind of interaction. So a smaller group right. tends to work better, but there's no fixed limit on it. Right. No. Well, this is the one that struck me. I, th I thought it was interesting just because of the way we tend to view things in our PC world. You say, it says here, men share best with men and women with women, as opposed to a, a, a mixed Bible study. I was kind of surprised. Is that um, your own experience? I'm not saying it's not true. I just thought it was interesting well, that in I got the, pointed out. Well, in the Netherlands, I, I have the, the mixed group. But... Um, it is my experience that uh, certainly in the beginning, after a while they get to know each other, but certainly in the beginning they didn't speak out so easily. Mm -hmm. Women were easier, the men were more reluctant. Mm -hmm. I could see that. So yes, there is something to that. And if they want to get started well, usually it works better. Mm -hmm. Men with men, women with women. But it's not necessarily so. Right, it's not a hard and, and fast rule. No, not at all. Right. And over a course of time, if they get to know each other well, it doesn't play right. any role anymore. Right, you also talk about the idea of a married couples group. I have myself no experience with that, as but you understand. But that's one of the ones that they've done for the series. But I, have, I understand that here in the States they have done that and that it works well because there are right. issues that couples have to deal with right. that are well understood by other couples. Right. And that would be harder for a priest or a single person to relate to. Right, and certainly uh, having myself been involved with Marriage Encounter years ago, it's uh, kind you of know that. have some understanding of that. And it's also <coughs> interesting here because you have what's called the wrap-up lecture. Hmm. And, and, and there should be a, so somebody's supposed to come in and give a lecture at the end of this? Well, is, uh, the idea is that if you study this with a group, there's one person who is responsible for that particular uh, get-together. Okay. Um, so he would study or she would study it more in detail and prepare everything. Mm -hmm. uh, that may be difficult for someone. So we actually have a, for each chapter, we have a 12 to 50 minute uh, DVD clip. Mm -hmm. Right, that's right. So there's, in fact, you have a copy of it here we'll show. On the yes, screen, exactly. Right? There are like three DVDs in there. Mm -hmm. So it covers the entire book. So what you could do, and I know that some groups do that, they start by watching that DVD, okay. 12 to 15 minutes, right. and that gives them a good head start, and then they are into the, you know, right. the, the chapters. Right. Uh, some would like to do that at the end, right. and both works, both okay. works. So it's fairly flexible though. It's right? very flexible, okay. you, you, you go with what works best. Okay. But you have to remember, um, everyone who comes to the group should have read some chapters mm -hmm. of the Bible. Uh, so there's homework involved. There's a little <laughs> homework involved. And then again, I know there are, you know, like, like young moms with children who cannot do that homework. Right. Well, they still can come and they can right. benefit from the and answers the that others can, have right. done. Right. So, right. see, there's not, it's not an iron law. You, you right. can go there. Well, let me ask you, because again, the other ones that I happen to have, Acts and Letters and, uh, and Genesis. Now, you ended and up... John, there's another one. Right, okay. Yeah. Is that what is the Gospel of John? Yeah. And it's, now you ended up with... Wisdom. Yep. Did you pick that? Did that? Was that suggested to you that that should be an area? Because do you really like to write about Job? I mean, I boy, love Job. you love oh. Job. Oh, I do. Okay, tell us about Job. And so you, was this one you picked to, to, to write about? Well, let me tell you first that the okay. series tries to cover the entire Bible. Okay. Um, how many, do you know how many books in total are out right now? There are 10 out. There's 10, 10 for okay. adults and okay. three for children. Okay. There's okay. also for children. Okay. Uh, the idea is to cover the whole Bible in 12 volumes. Okay. Um, and wisdom literature had not been covered yet. Mm -hmm. And when I did my uh, doctorate at the Biblicum, I uh, did my dissertation on mm -hmm. the wisdom literature, the wisdom of Jesus ben Sirach. Mm -hmm. So they asked me, would that not be a good idea for you to cover this part of the Old Testament? And I, I liked it, so mm -hmm. I did it. Mm -hmm. And these wisdom books, uh, Job, Psalms, uh, Proverbs, mm -hmm. uh, Song of Songs, uh, Ecclesiastes, you know, I really like them. 
Especially Job, I must say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Job is a wonderful book. What attracts you to Job? Uh, it's like a mirror, you see? When you read Job and you see all these agonizing situations that he finds himself mm -hmm. in and he's wondering why this, why that, right, right. that is the surface. Mm -hmm. But underneath something else is going on. So he knows that he has not sinned. He knows that. And he's correct. And we as readers know that. Though his friends are convinced he must have done something wrong. His right? friends are convinced that he did something wrong. What his friends do not know, what Job does not know, what we know, is that a deal was struck in heaven. Mm -hmm. So Job, knowing that he did not sin, wants to get things right. So God has to step in. Mm -hmm. And in the worldview of that time, that is before the exile, right. There was no afterlife. This conception of afterlife did not yet exist. It comes in the wisdom literature in the later books, but not yet then. So Job wants, by all means, to see God, to speak with him, and God does not answer. So he employs all kinds of tactics to lure God into the game. So he says, oh, I wish I was dead. I want to die. People dig holes to find treasures. I will dig a hole for my grave, and that will be my treasure. Right. Things like that. Mm. But it's a play. He wants to emphasize, to make it look real, that he has a death wish. Mm. Well, he hasn't. He only wants to be on good terms with God again. God is his friend, and God has said that as much. Mm -hmm. But he has his own terms. Mm -hmm. He wants to meet with God, but on his own terms. Mm -hmm. And he is very, very loath to give that up. Mm -hmm. And that is something very human. Right. We all want, you know, to be with God, but we have our conditions. Right. We have. Right. And in Job, we that is God's laid plan, out. But we have a couple of suggestions we'd like to make. A right. couple of strong <laughs> suggestions. <laughs> so in Job, that is played out so well. Mm -hmm. And if you follow the literary structure of the book and all the little hooks that are there, mm -hmm. you begin to see, oh, this is me, you know, and then. The end of the book, for some people, they say it comes very sudden, you know, God speaks in the storm and in the nature and then everything is okay. Mm -hmm. It's not like that. Mm -hmm. In the end, Job, just, uh, Job says just one thing. He says, now I see that you can do everything and I repent. I take back all I have said. Mm -hmm. But the, the important thing here is, I see that you can do everything. For you, nothing is impossible. That's the step of faith. Now Job is all in, mm -hmm. all, no reserves, no more plans of his own. He trusts God completely. He hands it over. Everything is possible with you. Mm -hmm. Even what I have suffered, it is possible with you. Complete trust. And that's why you say that the book of Job could be read as a kind of biblical answer to suffering. Yeah, in that way. Mm -hmm. Because if I may make the jump to the New Testament, when Jesus is uh, speaking with his disciples, and uh, there is this rich man who wants to join them, but he cannot give up his mm -hmm. wealth. They are shocked. He goes away sadly, and the disciples are shocked. Jesus says, well, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle mm -hmm. than for a rich man to enter into heaven. Mm -hmm. And they're completely shocked. Who can be saved? Right. His answer is, for God, that is not impossible. Possible. But you have to f believe him. You have mm -hmm. to have faith. And when the gospel comes to a conclusion, and Jesus is in, Gets, is in Gethsemane, he prays like that. Mm -hmm. Father, for you all things are possible. Let this chalice, mm, how is the, the English cup, wording? The cup Let the cup pass me by, right. but your, not, will. your will be done, not mine. My will, right. So what he asks of his disciples right. is faith. Right. When he faces his death, he faces it with complete mm -hmm. trust in the Father. Job does that in the end. That's, that's the attitude of faith that we need. Mm -hmm. So Job, it's Old Testament, yes, but human nature has not right. changed, you know, from all right. the New Testament. We are the same. Well, you say, uh, in this one section, you say, wisdom speaks from experience, youth lack experience. Do you think part of the problem we have today is that we, we tend to uh, idolize the youth culture too much and not enough oh, yeah. wisdom and experience? <clears throat> that is there, certainly, yeah, yeah. Um, I grew up on a farm, mm -hmm. and uh, in the same household there were our grandfather, grandmother, 
And when they died, there was two empty rooms. And across in another farm, there lived two old gentlemen who had between them just one room mm. to sleep, to eat, to work, to do everything. Right. So our father took them in in our house, so they right. had each a room. And we had two new grandparents, so to speak. Right. I've always had this benefit of living with the mm -hmm. elderly people. Right. And there's great wisdom in them, I can tell you. One thing, just before we go, because we're just out of time, the artwork is very interesting on the covers. And well, thank uh, you for noticing. Maybe you just want to mention yes. who that person is. So one person in the Bible studies group that I do in the Netherlands um, is uh, Sabina Muller. She's a German by birth mm -hmm. and lives in the Netherlands. She's a convert to Catholicism. She's a mother of four children right. and uh, a wonderful artist. Right. And she has done a lot for catechetical work. And for this book, I approached her and she has made this up herself. Right. So this is Lady Wisdom on the cover. Right. Uh, she has gone through the library and did really research on how the artifacts were in that time. Mm -hmm. And she has worked it in here. And I think right. she did a beautiful job. Well, it's very, very interesting and very different. And thank you so much, Your Excellency, for spending the time with us and, thank and you putting your efforts me. into this fine uh, scripture. Bible study series. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Our guest author has been Bishop Jan Leeson of the Diocese of Den Bosch in the Netherlands. And we've been talking about the Come and See Bible study series and the particular book on wisdom that he wrote. And of course, this is available through the EWTN Religious Catalog published by Emmaus Road. And uh, I'm Doug Keck inviting you to join us next time right here on EWTN's Book Talk.